Good day, everyone. Welcome to VeriSign's fourth quarter and full year 2020 earnings call. Today's conference is being recorded. Recording of this call is not permitted unless pre-authorized. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. David Ashley, Vice President of Investor Relations and Corporate Treasurer. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Operator. Welcome to VeriSign's fourth quarter and full year 2020 earnings call. Joining me are Jim Bidzos, Executive Chairman and CEO, Todd Struby, President and COO, and George Kilgus, Executive Vice President and CFO. This call and presentation are being webcast from the Investor Relations website, which is available under About Verisign on Verisign.com. There you will also find our earnings release. At the end of this call, the presentation will be available on that site, and within a few hours, the replay of the call will be posted. Financial results in our earnings release are unaudited, and our remarks include forward-looking statements that are subject to the risks and uncertainties that we discuss in detail in our documents filed with the SEC, specifically the most recent reports on Forms 10-K and 10-Q. VeriSign does not update financial performance or guidance during the quarter unless it is done through a public disclosure. The financial results in today's call and the matters we will be discussing today include GAAP results and two non-GAAP measures used by Veristein, adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow. Gap to non-gap reconciliation information is appended to the slide presentation, which can be found on the investor relations section of our website, available after this call. Jim and George will provide some prepared remarks, and afterward, we will open the call for your questions. With that, I would like to turn the call over to Jim. Thanks, David, and good afternoon, everyone. This past year has presented challenges and uncertainties for all of us. It has also been a year when our mission has never been more relevant. <clears throat> like many of you, we spent the majority of the year with most of our teams working remotely. During this time, we continue to maintain, invest in, and evolve our infrastructure, which enables us to reliably and accurately provide the critical DNS navigation service people around the world rely on more than ever. For commerce, education, healthcare, and person-to-person -person connection, while complying with the high operational standards as required by our ICANN agreements. Thanks to the dedication of our team and the resilience of the specialized network they operate and maintain, we extended our record of DNS availability to over 23 years during 2020, and we will continue our focus as it appears we will be working remotely well into 2021. Turning to our results, I'm pleased to report another consistent quarter that concludes a solid year of operational excellence for the company. As I mentioned, in 2020, we marked more than 23 years of uninterrupted availability of the VeriSign DNS for .com and .net. We also processed 42.4 million new registrations, delivered revenue of 1,265 million, and generated free cash flow of 687 million. During the full year 2020, we repurchased 3.7 million shares for 735 million. Effective today, the Board of Directors has increased the amount of Verisign common stock authorized for share repurchase by approximately $747 million to a total of $1 billion authorized and available under the share repurchase program, which has no expiration. Our financial and liquidity position remains stable with $1.17 billion in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities at the end of the quarter. We continually evaluate the overall liquidity and investing needs of the business and consider the best uses for our cash, including potential share repurchases. At the end of December, the domain name base in .com and .net totaled $165.2 million, consisting of 151.8 million names for .com and 13.4 million names for .net, with a year-over-year -year growth rate of 4%. During the fourth quarter, we processed 10.5 million new registrations and the domain name base increased by 1.46 million names. Although renewal rates are not fully measurable until 45 days after the end of the quarter, we believe that the renewal rate for the fourth quarter of 2020 will be approximately 73.5%. This preliminary rate compares to 73.8% achieved in the fourth quarter of 2019 and 73.7% .7 last quarter. Looking to 2021, we expect the domain name base growth rate of between 2.5% and 4.5%. As announced in today's earnings release, we have given notice of a price increase of 54 cents for the annual wholesale price for .com domain names, which raises the price from $7.85 to $8.39, effective September 1st, 2021. 
This represents the first wholesale price increase of .com domain names since 2012 and is in alignment with the limited and regulated pricing flexibility permitted under our registry agreement. This announcement is consistent with our statements over the last several months that we expected to effectuate an increase in the wholesale price of com domain names before October 25, 2021. We believe this position is com competitively in the marketplace. And now I'd like to turn the call over to George. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon, everyone. So the year ended December 31st, 2020. The company generated revenue of $1,265,000 up 2.7% from 2019. Operating expense totaled $441 million and was up 3.6% from last year. For the fiscal year, the company delivered operating income of $824 million up 2.2%, from 806 million a year ago, and a full year operating margin of 65.2%. Fourth quarter revenue came to 320 million, up 3.1% year over year. Operating expense totaled 116 million, compared to 111 million last quarter and 112 million in the fourth quarter a year ago. The quarter over quarter increase in operating expense is primarily a result of increased sales and marketing expenses. Fourth quarter operating income totaled 205 million compared with 199 million in the same quarter of 2019. The operating margin in the quarter came to 63.9%, which was unchanged from the same quarter a year ago. Net income totaled 157 million compared to 148 million a year earlier which produced diluted earnings per share of $1.38 in the fourth quarter this year compared to $1.26 for the same quarter last year. As noted in our earnings release, net income for the fourth quarter of 2020 included recognition of a $12.4 million of previously unrecognized income tax benefits as a result of the lapse of certain statutes of limitations. This income tax benefit increased Q4 diluted earnings per share by 11 cents. Operating cash flow for the fourth quarter was 195 million and free cash flow was on 189 million compared with 194 million and 185 million respectively for the fourth quarter last year. I'll now discuss full year 2021 guidance. Revenue is expected to be in the range of $1 billion, $300 million to $1 billion, $320 million. This revenue range forecast reflects the domain name-based growth rate of between 2.5% and 4.5% that Jim mentioned earlier. The operating margin is expected to be between 64% and 65%. This guidance range reflects our expectation of incremental and continued investment in our operational infrastructure in 2021. Also, this range reflects the annual $4 million payment to ICANN, which began this year to support activities to preserve and enhance the security, stability, and resiliency of the DNS and the internet. Interest expense and non-operating income net is expected to be an expense of between 88 million to 92 million. Capital expenditures are expected to be between 55 million and 65 million. This range reflects our ongoing investment in our infrastructure, as well as some expected 2020 capital spend that moved into 2021. The GAAP effective tax rate is expected to be between 20% and 23%. We expect the cash tax rate for 2021 to also be within the same guidance range. In summary, Verisign continued to demonstrate sound financial performance throughout last year and we look forward to continuing our focused execution in 2021. Now I'll turn the call back to Jim for his closing remarks. Thanks, George. I'd like to say again that our priorities continue to be our mission of ensuring the secure, reliable, and accurate operation of our critical internet infrastructure and the safety of our people. I also want to acknowledge once more the team here at Verisign for their hard work in maintaining and operating our infrastructure even during the challenges of working remote during the pandemic. Those efforts are undertaken almost entirely behind the scenes and are not well known, 
but there are many hundreds of dedicated professionals that develop, maintain, and operate our purpose-built network and have done so without service interruption for over 23 years. Even today, some people may think we still operate an SSL certificate authority, a PKI business that Verisign's predecessor, RSA Data Security, built going all the way back to 1986. That business was sold in 2010, and we have increasingly tightened our focus on our core mission of secure internet directory and registration services ever since. More information on just what we do today can be found on our homepage at verisign.com. Now we'd like to walk through a question which we believe is on your mind before opening the call for your additional questions. Many of you have asked, are there any updates on the status of .web? As we noted last quarter, a final hearing took place in early August of 2020. We expect a decision from the panel in the coming weeks, but we don't control the timing, and the panel is not operating any, under any deadline. And as a reminder, Verisign is not a party in these IRP proceedings, but was granted the right to participate in certain limited aspects. Also, as a reminder, an IRP under ICANN's bylaws is for the purpose of ensuring that ICANN follows its own policies and procedures when making decisions. Our expectation is that, that following the resolution of the IRP, the ICANN board will make a final decision on the delegation of the .web TLD. The guidance we provided today does not include revenue or expenses related to .web. Now we'll open the call to your questions. Operator, we're ready for the first question. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Also, in order to receive the best signal, please refrain from using your headset to ask a question. We'll take our first question from Rob Oliver with Robert W. Baird. Great. Uh, thank you guys uh, for taking my question. I appreciate it. Um, uh, George, I was just hoping we could walk uh, maybe through a little bit more of the thought process on the expense um, structure for, for 21 and, and then also uh, wanted to, 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 to so maybe get some color on that. I know um, you guys had talked a little bit in recent quarters about spending some more on the security side and um, certainly looked prescient given the headlines that happened in December, but wanted to get a sense for where you are uh, on that spend, whether you know the bodies that you need to hire have been hired, um, and then also on the CapEx comment, just wanted to uh, understand what it was that, that, that came out of last year and into this year and, and, and just get a little bit more color on, on the CapEx, which is you know higher than in our model, I believe. Hello? Yeah, were you guys George, able to hear my question? Yeah, we heard your question. Uh, George, um, I don't know if you're on mute, but just double checking. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I was. Um, so, yes, yeah, thanks Thanks for the question, Rod. Um, sorry to make that as answer you brilliantly to... twice, George. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, but... Uh, you know, we've been talking about this uh, most of the year that we've been making additional investments in both our infrastructure and our cybersecurity initiatives. Uh, and, and you see this bearing out in our numbers as both uh, R&D and G&A are up uh, in those areas. Uh, and we continue to invest in personnel and uh, hardware and software tools uh, in those areas. Um, you know, as far as uh, 2021, uh, we expect uh, our expenses to be similar as a percent of revenue next year for most of the categories that we report on, with the exception of cost of revenue, which we expect uh, will increase slightly as a percent of revenue for next year. Um, as far as uh, capital expenditures, um, you know, as stated in my prepared remarks, uh, capital expenditures are expected to be between 55 million and 65 million, and that again reflect, reflects ongoing investment in our infrastructure, uh, as well as some uh, expected 2020 capital spend that slipped into 2021. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we guided uh, uh, between 55 and 65 million. Last year, we guided between 45 and 55 million at this time. Uh, so this year's range is slightly uh, higher than last year, but uh, uh, we feel uh, these investments are appropriate to uh, continue to ensure the security and stability uh, of our infrastructure. Great, 
that's helpful. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. And then, Jim, just one for you, if I may. Um, just, uh, you know, <clears throat> obviously the price increases, so I'm glad you guys were able to get those through. Um, you know, on the, the the domain outlook for the year, it's a bit, it's a bit of a wide range, and, and, and I just wanted to maybe get your thought process on that. I guess probably understandable given a lot of, you know, macro economic puts and takes, but just wanted to get your sense. And I think you said two and a half to four and a half. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm sorry, did you just want clarification? Um, yeah, on... just, right, I mean, just it, 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 it would love some clarity on your thought process on on, on that range. Uh, I'm not sure I can give you any more detail beyond that, I guess. Um, maybe I don't understand your question. Let me uh, uh, Yeah, here. so that, that's, that, I mean, at the low end of that range, that's, that's a that's a growth number that would be below GDP growth, and just you know, in, is is there other elements of I mean, we saw some pull forward potentially, or maybe we didn't uh, due to COVID, um, you know, or where we saw some domain activity where you know uh, you guys ended up the year uh, you know at the high end of your above your the range of your initial domain guidance, um, which I think, you know, nobody would have expected probably in the spring. So, um, you know, is there a sense that we have a bit of a hangover on that from that on domains? On is that why the low end would be factored? And just, you know, any color there, if possible, would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is George. And maybe, maybe I can jump in here a, a little bit. Um, so, you know, I would say in general that the trends that we're seeing in the uh, domain name base are, are similar to the trends we, we've been seeing the last few quarters in that, um, registrars from both North America and EMEA um, are, are performing very well, uh, and that growth has been uh, slightly offset by uh, some slower activity from registrars based in China. Uh, but as you saw, yes, in the fourth quarter, we had a pretty solid uh, quarter, uh, delivering about 10.5 uh, uh, million registrations, which was up from 10.3 a year ago. Um, and during the year, as we talked about, we have saw uh, some increased demand in those regions from um, People looking to get online, um, uh, new business starts, uh, and, uh, and, and there's been new functionality created in the registrar community from website builders. Uh, as we look into next year, um, you know we uh, we still see those trends continuing. However, um, you know we're not sure uh, how the uh, the market will react as we come out of this work from home environment. Um, and so uh, we're being, you know, we typically do have a, a range this, this, this wide going into the year. Uh, January is off to a pretty good start. But um, uh, right now we sit here, that's our expectation between 25 and 4.5%. And as we go through the year, we'll update you on that, on that range. Yeah, I, Great, uh, thank you. I, I, I understand your question. I guess I, I, if, if the uh, idea is to sort of associate some macroeconomic considerations in and somehow relate them to, to the guidance that we gave. I think uh, probably the only thing I can really say about that is that there's obviously a, uh, some uncertainty associated with how COVID is going to play out in, in 2021. Um, there are you know, a lot of ups and downs and gives and takes, and um, that certainly is a factor that affects it. But uh, and as George said, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into the range. Um, uh, but I would say if you wanted one macroeconomic indicator, there's obviously some uncertainty around COVID. That's probably the, the single biggest influence in that range. Okay. Thank you again. We'll go ahead and take our next question from Nick Jones with City. Great. Thanks for uh, taking the questions. Um, I guess first, and this is this is probably splitting hairs, uh, but but could you have taken another penny in the price increase or is it because like it's slightly over 7% you can't I guess any, any clarity there. Um, and then the, yeah. I guess the follow up is, you've got you know, it. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. You've got it right. Uh, the problem is that um, if you apply, uh, we don't, we don't, um, we don't bill in fractions of a penny. And the actual increase came in with a 0.9 on the to the right of the decimal point in pennies. And so, even though the number was a nine, we rounded down because otherwise we would be slightly over the seven percent. Got it. Got it. That's helpful. Um, and then on, you know, COVID kind of threw a wrinkle, I think, into you know potentially how how, how investors were thinking about the price increases. 
how, how should we think about the cadence from here? I mean, is it something that's like you kind of expect to happen annually? Is there room to compress the time frame and take them earlier? I guess just how, how are how are you thinking about the cadence of the price increases over the next few years as, as the you know the windows open? Uh, Nick, this is uh, this is George. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we I was uh, on mute, George. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, mute is uh, tricky. Um, I'll let George weigh in, but basically, we don't guide to future price increases. And today's announcement is only for an increase in com domain registration fees uh, that's effective and begins on September 1st of this year. Beyond that, you know, obviously, we don't guide. Uh, George, if you want to comment, please go ahead. Uh, th- those are going to be my comments, Jim, as well. Yeah, Great. sorry, I was on mute there for. Okay, one, uh, w- one last question, just kind of as you know, COVID restrictions maybe loosen in certain markets, vaccines are rolling out. Are, are you seeing any change in kind of the trends we saw in twenty uh, twenty in terms of people's you know, SMBs uh, switching to digital solutions, people leaning into online solutions. Um, is there any meaningful changes and trends kind of early in this year, early in the year in, in certain regions, uh, even just within the U.S. in terms of uh, registrations or, or anything to kind of give you pause uh, as to kind of how the reopening may impact these trends? Thanks. Um, yeah, Nick, this is George. Um, I don't see any materially uh, difference in, in the trends uh, that we saw last quarter, um, uh, even through January. Uh, the only thing I'll, I'll just mention is, uh, you know, we do have a little seasonality in our business from time to time, uh, and we do get uh, impacted uh, by holidays. Uh, and uh, the Chinese New Year this year is uh, a little bit later. I think it was um, in uh, late January last year, and it's uh, in early February this year. But uh, other than that, to answer your question, uh, nothing yet that we've seen uh, to change our, our views. Great. Thanks for taking the question. And we'll take our final question from Sterling Audi with J.P. Morgan. Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. When I saw that you announced the price increase, I'm like, damn, what am I going to ask on the call now that you announced the increase? Uh, <laughs> well, that's, is that the question? <laughs> no, no, of course not. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with renewal rate, the you know down 20 bips year over year. Anything that you saw in particular this year, whether it be, I noticed that over the last month, there was a couple of days, one where I think the domain base was down 93,000, another one that was down like 102. Sometimes I usually equate that to some of the registrars going through and doing some purges. So any, anything like that that may have impacted the renewal rate in the quarter? Um, Sterling, as, as you pointed out, the renewal to rate uh, was, was relatively flat year to year. I mean, 73.5% in the fourth quarter versus 73.8% um, in the fourth quarter of 2019. So, uh, so relatively similar. Um, you know, we, we uh, did uh, have uh, a very strong uh, 2019 uh, performance from China-based registrars. Um, and as we talked before, um, you know, as a group, we tend to see their first-time renewal rates um, come out a little bit lower. And as that cohort was renewing this year, uh, that did uh, um, put a little uh, downward pressure, I would say, on our first-time uh, renewing rates for uh, the international group as a whole. But uh, again, I think overall, 73.5% was a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good result. No, that that makes sense. You made the comment that dot web neither the revenue or expenses are factored into the guidance. If we just say hypothetically that you get the approval and you can move forward to getting it up and running, what should be some of the cost levels that investors should expect to get it launched? And perhaps some of your thoughts around the marketing muscle in terms of spend that you might put behind it at launch. Sterling, I think, um, you know, I, I, I guess with, with all of the, um, the process part of the IRP complete and we're waiting, uh, I think I can say, you know, repeat what I said earlier, which is that we're, we, we hope that we're weeks away from something from uh, the panel. 
we're certainly closer as time moves on, but I think it's just too early to give any indication of a, a timeline from there to the launch of web or any of the costs associated with it. I, it's just kind of early. Okay. And then last question from my side is, in the U.S., if you look at the new business applications, they spiked late summer, early fall. So think August, September timeframe. But they're still elevated in the in the fourth quarter, especially on a year-over-year -year basis. If I think about that relative to your new domain registrations, the 10.5, new registrations have been up relative to kind of historical norm, norms for, for a while now. Is there a correlation there? And does that actually give you some confidence that, you know, hopefully the economy opens back up on the back of vaccines and perhaps we could see even faster domain growth in 21? So, so Sterling, we've seen that same data, um, and as you know, we're uh, a thin registry, so, um, you know, we do get some insights from our registrar partners, and from what we hear from them, uh, yes, uh, new business starts, and, and uh, companies uh, finding that they, they can better serve their customers by having a website, and ergo a domain name helps to facilitate that. Um, th I think that's been good for our business here uh, in this work-from-home environment. Um, you know, as Jim mentioned, uh, you know, when the uh, pandemic subsides and, and things start opening it up, you know, uh, I think it could probably go either way. Either it could accelerate or it could uh, slow a little bit. Uh, we're just not sure how the market would react, just, just as we were somewhat uncertain when this whole pandemic started. Um, but that clearly is a possibility. And, and maybe just a follow-up to that, on a mix of, of domains, you know, the, the new TLDs, I think, have given back some of the share uh, that we saw them, you know, saw that category gain in years past, you know, are, are you seeing that mix having any impact on your business? Uh, I, I guess the mix of. Well, so sure to be more that. specific, you know, you're a thin registry, but you work with hundreds of registrars on a global basis. Are, are registrars coming back to you? given that you do do marketing programs and suggesting that they want to put more muscle behind .com because they're just not seeing the traction that perhaps they expected in the new TLDs. I, I, I guess I would just, you know, I think the best answer I can give you to that question is, is um, one that I think is just a simple fact, which is that com is a recognizable brand that, you know, helps people get found online. It's, um, it's a popular, well-established brand. I, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of any specific, deliberate effort um, that that we've been informed of, of of any kind of a shift like you're describing. George, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think that's right, Jim. I mean, I, I think that's probably a great question for uh, one of the registrars on these calls, but um, as to what they're seeing specifically. But, um, you know, our programs tend to be relatively set at the beginning of the year. We roll them out, we announce them, um, and, uh, and we, we tend not to change them too much um, year over year um, or inter year, I would say. But um, I don't think I have anything more to add than what, uh, what Jim commented on. Understood. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'd like to now turn the call back to Mr. David actually for any final comments. Thank you, operator. Please call the Investor Relations Department with any follow-up questions from this call. Thank you for your participation. This concludes our call. Have a good evening. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.